So I'd like to begin by recognizing that we live and work on the traditional territories of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. I am personally joining from the unceded territory of the Squamish people in Squamish, British Columbia. Please feel free to share your own land acknowledgements in the chat. As I mentioned earlier, today's webinar is part of a series of webinars highlighting how school divisions across Canada are supporting workplace well-being. It's just one of the many ways EdCan is working towards our goal of embedding well-being into all aspects of Canadian K-12 education systems so that we can support workplace well-being in a durable and sustainable way. In addition to the Stories of Success webinars, we offer Well at Work advising services, professional learning opportunities, a pan-Canadian community of practice, and an awareness building platform that includes a variety of free website or free resources available through our website. Our next community of practice actually meets tomorrow and we'll be looking at how do we build inclusive cultures in our schools and workplaces. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest today. Sarah Scahill is the health and wellness manager for Medicine Hat Public School Division, where she's responsible for employee health promotion, disability management, and attendance support programs. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Sarah over the past year through our work together on the core group that guides the Well at Work community of practice. Today, I'm excited for her to share the progress that Medicine Hat Public Schools is making to support workplace well-being. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I will kick it off with a little bit of my background and just to kind of give you the lens that I'm looking at this work from. Uh, because it's different than an educator's lens. I am not a teacher or working in the education system in schools. So um, hi everyone, I'm Sarah Scahill. I'm a registered nurse and a certified disability management professional. I'm currently finishing my Master of Health Studies degree with a dual focus on health research and leadership. And this degree has empowered me to understand the dynamics between organizational practices and the physical and mental well-being of employees. I started my work with Medicine Hat Public School Division about five years ago, and I've been pursuing it ever since. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about our journey, uh, where we've got to, and some of the learnings we've had along the way. So I'm going to go back to 2017. Uh, it was actually before I even started here. The superintendent of schools here, Mark Davidson, um, directed that the board create um, an employee wellness program and do some work around support, uh, supporting employee well-being. So the initial project was an employee engagement survey in 2017. It was um, done by the human resource director at that time. And they identified um, some issues with, sorry, they asked staff about things around like their employee family assistance program, were they familiar with it, uh, stress, the culture of well-being, and then also what kind of wellness support staff wanted to see offered from the division and how the division could assist them. At the same time, the director of HR had also noted a need for a position like mine uh, to support employee health and wellness, including sick leave support and workplace accommodations, which is disability management. Uh, and so they were doing um, interviewing for my position and starting a, a lot of this work um, kind of simultaneously. When I came on, one of the first things I did was review that engagement survey um, and noted that there were four main areas that employees had identified with, with the, where they wanted to see extra support. So those four areas were physical fitness, uh, mindfulness and meditation support and resources, uh, sleep supports, and then having on-site flu vaccines for flu season. So we created an employee wellness committee um, that was very much just focused on staff well-being, and they used those four areas as the pillars for their work. Knowing that, we still recognize that wellness was so much more than just the yoga and the meditation. Those are absolutely important components of someone's well-being, but we really wanted to know the cause of absenteeism. What was making people feel unwell? And more importantly, how could the employer help? How could the division help people um, in preventing illness or supporting them on their return to work when they were coming back. So one of my first tasks as the health and wellness manager was to create a disability management program and process and also an attendance support program. And they are 
fully intended to support employee well-being. Um, so I did those things in the first year of initiating our attendance support and disability management programs. We saw an eight and a half percent reduction in casual sick leave. And then in the second year, we saw a 10% reduction um, in casual sick leave and numerous, I don't have the exact amount, but more than 100 people um, received workplace accommodations and we were able to continue integrating that with our wellness committee work as well. So then in 2019, we did a follow-up engagement survey. Uh, we really wanted to know where we had hit the mark, where we needed to grow some more and kind of what the overall culture was. So the survey questions were structured so that they were, would still be comparable to the 2017 survey and we'd have some really accurate and valid data. Um, we did realize that a significant number more of our population um, knew about their EFAP program, so our employee assistance program, but not only did they know about it, they actually um, knew what it did. So just hearing that you had one was one component, but knowing what services you could get is another one. Um, the crisis report services or crisis um, support services were definitely the most commonly known. So things like counseling when in times of need or reactive care. Um, so one area that we identified was we, we needed to do more health promotion on the support and uh, life coaching services that you can get through an EFAP. So things like nutrition support or accessing you know, legal, legal counsel or financial supports and education and just really putting out there what was available to staff at no cost to support their whole holistic well-being, not just diet and exercise. So that was one thing. Um, we also noted that we had a significant increase in the reported culture of wellness. So 87% of respondents, and we had about a 40% response rate. Um, so 87% of respondents of this survey felt that Medicine Hat Public School Division truly valued staff well-being. So we really took that um, positively. We felt like we were really getting there. The message was getting out. Um, however, we did still have some areas of growth identified as we always would. So we asked staff how many staff had experienced stress or burnout in the previous 12 months that had led them to consider quitting their job or finding a new career. Um, and 48% at that time, almost half of the staff who answered had experienced negative stress to a point that they considered quitting their job. That was an alarming statistic for me, like quite significant. And when we asked about the reasons for this, um, the top three reasons were job demands, challenging student behaviors, and then struggling with work-life balance. And I would argue to this day, those are probably the top three reasons across the country, still in education um, for people who are struggling with uh, their health and well-being, that those would be a significant um, impact. So based on the data that I had received there, I met with our Associate Superintendent of Student Services, uh, Tracy Hensel, and her and I kind of reviewed the data to figure out how we could better address the issues in a more fulsome way. So we were looking at all of the employee engagement data, but we also looked at things like the PD requests, professional development requests that were coming in from staff. And a lot of those were related to wanting to understand how to manage challenging needs in a classroom. And what we realized was that staff well-being is directly correlated to student well-being. You cannot separate staff wellness and student wellness. They are one thing. Um, so the one size fits all approach we were using for well-being, we realized that does not work. So we decided to shift our focus from an employee wellness committee focused on just staff well-being to the comprehensive school health framework and having individualized planning at every school. Um, we acknowledge that every site has their own needs, values, cultures, and so they needed something specific to their school. So what we did was we established and we intentionally named them the comprehensive school health teams at every site. We wanted consistent language. And these teams were made up of a health champion. Health champion's role is to focus on the student population. A wellness champion whose role is to focus on the staff population. Uh, we have an administrator um, or a delegate, but I can tell you out of all of our schools, 
all principals are on these committees because they believe in the work. So the leaders of each school are on this committee. We have our family school liaison workers who are the registered social workers in our system that help navigate community supports to families and students who need additional support. Um, we've got our mental health capacity building success coaches, which is a partnership program through Alberta Health Services. Um, those are workers in our school that are really doing our mental health um, capacity building in our students and promoting mental health. And then any other staff who are deemed or felt necessary or who want to join. So in some of our bigger schools, we have our teacher counselors on the committee. Um, in some of the schools, we have educational assistants on the committee. In the past, we have had representation from custodial, um, but we currently don't have any, though I would love to do it. And that's something I'm working on is getting a more diverse voice brought into those committees. But for the most part, every school has those basic uh, represent representatives at their site, and they're the ones doing their site specific planning. So they meet about every six weeks or so. Um, and they do kind of a pulse check. What's going on at the school? What are some areas of need? What can they do in terms of reaching out to community for support or reaching out to families? Um, what is needed, whether it's a staff staff issue or a student issue, and they, they plan to support those things. At the beginning of every year, I also provide each school like a living document through, it's a Google Doc. Um, that outlines all of the major division wide initiatives that we will be planning throughout the year. And then the schools have the autonomy to figure out how they're going to implement that in their school. So examples of those would be things like our World Mental Health Day. Um, we just had International Kindness Day, Anti Bullying Awareness. We have Nutrition Month in March. So as a division, we're promoting these things, but every school has the autonomy to figure out how is that going to look like in their school and what are they going to do? What kind of planning will they do to support that? Um, on top of all those things, like I said, they do the pulse check and they figure out what's going on in their school and they plan events to support individualized things at each school level. So some of these examples are things like staff connection events. So maybe just going for coffee, either at the school or after school events to really promote more of a social connection looking at how they can leverage um, student leadership opportunities. That was, that's always a big one, really building leadership from a young age moving forward. Um, and like I said, connecting parent councils with community partners. So we have in the past, and um, even currently, I think this year already, we've provided education to parent councils and families on topics like social media use in youth, um, youth mental health, nutrition, um, those types of things. Uh, so the teams, after they meet, they send me uh, meeting minutes from every meeting, and I review all those minutes. Sometimes I didn't think they actually thought I did, but I really do. I read all their minutes, and I look to see if there's anything I can help bring in from a systems level or how we can support an initiative going on in a school, but also so that I can share out other ideas with other schools that may come to me for um, ideas on how they can promote something. We are currently working on creating kind of a central platform where all schools can access each other's meeting minutes because it has been brought up um, that they would like to be able to do that and it would be a very useful learning tool. Um, so I'm hoping to have that done actually by the new year and we'll have that available to all of our staff. Um, and then the incentives. So this year we've also created an incentive. So they send me the meeting minutes and once I get them, it enters them into a draw for a comprehensive school health team cash. Um, it's only about 200 bucks if you win the draw, but it's amazing what 200 bucks can do for motivation in a school where usually the dollars are zero. Um, so we are able to transfer them $200 and in that's intended to support any of their health and well wellness initiatives that they're doing. Um, so again, it's a draw. We only have seven a year, so not every school will get it, but um, most schools will get it over the course of a couple of years. Um, another initiative we did was in 2022. So last year we partnered with our school health promotion facilitator at Alberta Health Services. It's a mouthful, I say that three times fast. Um, and we completed interviews at every site using the Canadian Healthy Schools Standards Survey. And we actually had executive leadership, so superintendent, um, associate superintendents, 
all attended these meetings with every school. And we have 18 schools in Medicine Hat Public School Division um, to show that they supported this work, but also to be part of the discussion. And these, the Canadian Healthy School Standards really helped emphasize what true comprehensive school health is. Um, again, more than yoga and smoothies, it's much deeper than that and really helped us to recognize all the great things we were doing and then further areas of growth. Um, so all of our schools completed this survey. They all scored quite well. Um, it qualified every one of Medicine Hat Public School Division schools to um, receive a National Healthy School Certification. And we actually had 11 out of 18 of our schools complete the whole process and they were formally recognized with that national certification at the end of last year. So um, we held a little bit of a celebration for them earlier this fall um, and really recognized that work. And they've all registered again and they're all hoping to go for year two and get more of our schools um, healthy school certified. Um, so one other learning with our comprehensive school health team. So these teams, like I said, they have been working fantastically. Um, it was definitely the right idea to give them a more focused uh, goal to plan just for their site, but we still get requests for collaboration and information sharing on a broader scale. So at the beginning of this year, we decided to do um, what we called our comprehensive school health team kickoff. And we held it in early October. We invited all of our comprehensive school health team members to the meeting. Um, we also had student services there, a superintendent, myself, and our partner from Alberta Health Services. We had about 85 to 90 people in total, um, which is quite a big day for a PD session in our office, um, but it was awesome. Uh, we did a little bit of refreshment on the first hour. We kind of reviewed um, just Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we utilize the indigenous based model of the circle of courage and how these theories both tied into comprehensive school health and how supporting comprehensive school health is really identifying needs right down to the basic needs level and then building up to to reach optimal functioning. Um, and then from there, we went into a world cafe event and this got really fun because we actually put out um, like checkered coffee. Um, uh, tablecloths and we decorated and I put on some like Italian cafe music and had some pictures on the screen really tried to transform the environment and really promote that creativity and collaboration and it worked um, we had tons of energy in that room uh, we divided the conversation into six topics so attendees had to choose to discuss either physical activity mental health nutrition leadership diversity equity inclusion or recognition and reward strategies. Um, they were only allowed to go to a maximum of three tables and we limited how many people were at a table so that all of the topics had really robust discussion. And the information we got after was amazing. It took me quite a while to go through. We had pages and pages of um, just qualitative data, the like statements and ideas and the, there were dreamers, but there were things people were doing and we really brought it um, all together. I ended up taking all of that data and reviewed it with executive leadership and then created like an executive summary document for all of our teams to use in their future planning. Uh, and then since that meeting, the meeting minutes that I've gotten back from the schools have also been phenomenal. They are really showing that the choices they're making for um, strategies that are intentional, um, they're reflective, they're connecting it with um, comprehensive school health and basic needs. So. A few examples, because I know I talk about it, people are like, what does that mean? Uh, so a few examples would be like uh, staff having snacks with students to model healthy, diverse food options, but also to promote social skills and just that connection time. Or some schools have um, like drink carts, whether it's coffee, tea, water, smoothies that are led by students and they're taking them and giving them out to staff. So it promotes that leadership opportunity for students but also giving that um, recognition reward um, aspect to staff. So little things like that, they don't sound like big things. They don't have to be, they're making a difference in our schools. Another one that I love that's been kind of expanding in most of our schools is High Five Fridays. Um, it's where the principal comes in on a Friday, gives a gift card to a staff member and 
every staff member, you have to high five your colleagues. And if you have the gift card and you're high five, you have to pass it on to that person who high fived you. And now it goes on all day long. Um, and whoever has the gift card at the end of the day is the one who gets to keep the gift card. But the uh, connection and relationship building that happens during the day because of that, it's also positive, has been really, really fun to watch. And we've had good feedback from uh, schools who have implemented that as well. Um, some of the other things are more frequent, but still making sure it's genuine shout out. So some schools are doing things like a staff shout out Google Doc, um, or they're doing stuff on announcements to recognize or thank people for doing some work, um, or just building a bulletin board on the staff room and having a shout out that way to recognize their colleagues. Uh, they're also doing things for students, whether it be um, student shout outs again on the announcements or bulletin boards in the hallway, but really recognizing and rewarding um, positive behaviors and interactions. Um, a few other ones I thought were notable were having like student-led mindfulness or meditation um, once a week over the intercom. There was one school doing that and it was it was quite well received. Um, another school has really tried to leverage the FNMI team that we have. We have our First Nations Métis Inuit team and uh, they brought them in to do some storytelling and Indigenous teachings during the lunch hour um, to designated classes so students will be learning but also having that social connection and learning more on the truth and reconciliation side of things as well. Um, uh, and then encouraging that family connection. Um, one event we do have coming up and I think it's gonna be in May that I'm quite excited about is our diversity day. So one of our schools is hosting a diversity day where they are planning to highlight all the different backgrounds of their citizens in that school and then celebrating their uniqueness. I don't know all the details, but I know when I heard about it, I got chills. I thought that's amazing. I think that's a really great idea. And I'm really excited to see how that one shakes out. And I hope that's something that we can actually expand across the division. And I think that'll be an awesome one. I just wanted to let everyone know, I do invite you to check out our Medicine Hat Public Schools social media. Um, there is a bit of a video recap of our comprehensive school health team kickoff day, but you can also see some of the other work that we're doing. Um, our communications coordinator does an amazing job of really promoting that stuff. Amazing. Yeah, um, and I think that's kind of the wrap up, but I just wrote a summary because I know I talked a lot and about a lot of things, but I'll just summarize the, our key learning. So the one thing I realized right off the bat, one size fits all approach doesn't work. You need to have an individualized plan for each school. Every school has their own needs and values, so they need the ability to do that. However, information sharing between schools is still critical. So it's worth the investment to bring those people together who do those work, whoever that looks like, um, and having them share their knowledge and um, just really build upon the work that's being done. But also um, disability and management and attendance support programs, uh, they work and they are connected to workplace well-being. So when we're able to provide a workplace accommodation for someone or support an employee who may not be able to do the full aspect of their job but we can help you know gradually um, bring them back or meet them where they're at and provide them meaningful work with what they can do it supports the organization and the employee in so many positive ways and i can't say enough about um, workplace accommodations i do know it's something that a lot of boards um, struggle with just because of having the resources to do the work but it's definitely something that i think needs to be um, talked about more often and I would be glad to answer any questions about that because that's an area of passion for me and uh, something that I have a bit of knowledge in. So. Huh. Fantastic. I don't know if that was too long or too short. Nope, that was perfect. I have, I have two questions to kick us off and then I'll stop the recording and if anybody else has questions they'd like to ask. Um, since you finished up on attendance support disability management, at the beginning you talked about um, reductions in casual absences um, once you started implementing these programs has I know we had COVID that would have affected data collection but have you continued to see improvements with all this much broader work to support well-being the launch of the comprehensive school health teams 
Yeah, so I have to pull, I actually have to pull our data because we present to the board in December and I always present on it, but I'm usually watching it. I would say um, we have seen a bit of an increase, which I'm going to call the COVID rebound. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, I do feel like it's still well received. Um, I absolutely am very busy doing a lot of workplace accommodations all the time. To be honest, that is 90% of my job is doing the workplace accommodations. The employee health promotion is a um, lot less part of my portfolio, although I'd like it one day to be opposite. It's currently it's not how it works. Um, but it's also hard to dictate. It's one of those things where I can't pinpoint one mm -hmm. specific reason of why you know, we may see a reduction in absenteeism or why we may see an increase in reported culture of wellness. It's really a culmination of all the things we do. And it's building that, it's essentially building psychological health and safety in our environment and really improving on that work. So I would love to be able to say, yes, do X and you'll get Y, but I can't. <laughs> Well-being is too complex for that. Yes. <laughs> um, and my other question was, you mentioned you had the six topics that you used for the World Cafe as part of your kickoff meeting. How did you choose those six topics? So the first three, the physical activity, mental health focus, and nutrition are three topics that Alberta Health Services focuses on heavily in their school health promotion program. And I do recognize um, being in Alberta and having a provincial health service support schools is actually quite unique. Most other provinces do not have that in their um, available to them. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think it's an area of growth across the country because there is definitely some benefit for it. But um, so AHS supports the physical health, mental health and nutrition are the three topics that they provide the most resources from to our team. But what really led to um, the leadership, the DEI, and the recognition and reward was my studying of psychological health and safety and understanding kind of what was needed to build on that in our um, district. We haven't done the Guarding Minds survey yet. We will be. It's coming. Um, but those were three areas that I felt were just really important and areas that we were already doing some work in. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I thought we could just leverage it even more. Wonderful. 